Chapter One of Yollop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. Chapter One. In the first place, Mr. Yollop knew nothing about firearms, and so, after he had overpowered the burglar and relieved him of a fully loaded thirty-eight, he was singularly unimpressed by the following tribute from the bewildered and somewhat exasperated captive. Say, ain't you got any more sense than to tackle a man with a gun, you chuckle-headed idiot? Only he did not say chuckle-headed, and he inserted several expletives between say and ain't. The dazed intruder was hunched limply, in a sitting posture, over against the wall, one hand clamped tightly to his jaw, the other being elevated in obedience to a command that had to be thrice repeated before it found lodgment in his whirling brain. Mr. Yollop, who seemed to be satisfied with the holding up of but one hand, cupped his own hand at the back of one ear and demanded querulously, What say? Are you hard of hearing? Eh? Well, for the say, are you deaf? Don't say deaf, say deaf, as if it were spelled double E double F. Yes, I am a little hard of hearing. Now how the hell did you hear? I say, how did you hear me in the room, if it's a fair question? If you've got anything in your mouth, spit it out. I can't make out half what you say. Sounds like, olo, olo, olo. The thief opened his mouth and with his tongue instituted a visible search for the obstruction that appeared to annoy Mr. Yollop. They're all here except the one I had pulled last year he announced vastly relieved. A sharp spasm of pain in his jaw caused him to abruptly take advantage of a recent discovery, and while he was careful to couch his opinions in an undertone, he told Mr. Yollop what he thought of him in terms that would have put the hardiest pirate to blush. Something in Mr. Yollop's eye, however, and the fidgety way in which he was fingering the trigger of the pistol, moved him to interrupt a particularly satisfying paean of blasphemy by breaking off short in the very middle of it to wonder why in god's name he hadn't had sense enough to remember that all deaf people are lip-readers spit it out repeated mr yollop with energy don't talk with your mouth full i can't understand a word you say this was reassuring but not convincing there was still the ominous glitter in the speaker's eye to be reckoned with the man on the floor took the precaution to explain i hope you didn't hear what i was calling myself he spoke loudly and very distinctly. "'That's better,' said Mr. Yollop, his face brightening. "'I was afraid my hearing had got worse without my knowing it. All you have to do is to enunciate distinctly, and speak slowly like that, as if you were isolating the words, so to speak, and I can make out everything you say. What were you calling yourself?' "'Oh, just a lot of names. I'd sooner not repeat them if there's any women in the house.' "'Well, bless my soul.' That's uncommonly thoughtful of you. My sister and her young daughter are here to spend the holidays with me. They sleep at the back of the apartment. Now, if you will just remain as you are, I dare say you better put up that other hand, too, if you can spare it. I will back up to the table here and get my listening apparatus. Now, you won't have to shout so. I don't know much about revolvers, but I assume that all one has to do to make it go off is to press rather firmly on this little contrivance. Yes, but don't. Not so loud, not so loud. I'm not as deaf as all that. And don't move. I give you fair warning. Watch me closely. If you see my eyes shut, you will know I'm going to shoot. Remember that, will you? The instant you detect the slightest indication that my eyes are about to close, dodge. By thunder, I... I wonder if you're as much of a blame fool as you seem to be, or are you just playing horse with me? muttered the victim as he raised his other hand. I'd give ten years of my life to know. I won't be a second, announced Mr. Yollop, backing gingerly toward the table. With his free hand he felt for and found the rather elaborate contraption that furnished him with the means to counteract his auricular deficiencies. The hand holding the revolver wobbled a bit. Nevertheless, the little black hole, at which the dazed robber stared as if fascinated, was amazingly steadfast in its regard for the second or perhaps the third button of his coat. It's a rather complicated arrangement, he went on to explain, but very simple once you get it adjusted to the ear. 
It took me some time to get used to wearing this steel band over the top of my head. I never have tried to put it on with one hand before. Amazing how awkward one can be with his left hand, isn't it? Now, you see how it goes. This little receiver business clamps right down to the ear, so. Then this disc hangs over my chest, and you talk right at it. For a while, I made a practice of concealing it under my vest, being somewhat sensitive about having strangers see that I am deaf. But one day, my niece, a very bright child often, asked me why I did it. I told her it was because I didn't want people to know I was deaf. Have you ever felt so foolish that you wanted to kick yourself all over town? Well, then you know how I felt when that blessed infant pointed to this thing in my ear and, what say? I say, that's the way I've been feeling ever since I came to, repeated the disgusted burglar. Of course, I realize that it's a physical, you might well say a scientific impossibility for one to kick himself all over town, but just the same. I believe you are as nearly in the mood to accomplish it as any man alive today. You bet I could, snapped the thief with great earnestness. When I think how I let a skinny half-witted boob like you walk right into a clinch with me, and me holding a gun, and weighing forty pounds more than you do, I... Can you hear what I'm saying? Perfectly. It's a wonderful invention, said Mr. Yollop, who had approached to within four or five feet of the speaker, and was bending over to afford him every facility for planting his words squarely upon the disc. Speak in the same tone of voice that you would employ if I were about thirty feet away and perfectly sound of hearing. Just imagine, if you can, that I am out in the hall, with the door open, and you are carrying on a conversation with me at that— I said all I want to say, growled the other sullenly. What is your name? None of your damn business. Mr. Yollop was silent for a moment. Then he inquired steadily, Have you any recollection of receiving a blow on the jaw, and subsequently lying on the flat of your back, with my knees jouncing up and down on your stomach, while your bump of amativeness was being roughly and somewhat regularly pounded against the wall, in response to a certain nervous and uncontrollable movement of my hands, which happened to be squeezing your windpipe so tightly that your tongue hung out and— You bet I remember it, ruefully. Well, then— said Mr. Yollop. What's your name? Jones. What? I thought you said you could hear with that thing. I heard you say Jones quite distinctly, but why can't you answer my question? It was civil enough, wasn't it? Well, said the crook, still decidedly uncertain as to the expression in Mr. Yollop's eye, if you insist on a civil answer, it's Smilk. Smith? No, not Smith, hastily and earnestly. Smilk. S-M-I-L-K. Smilk? Smilk. Extraordinary name. I've never heard it before. Have you? The rascal blinked. Sure. It was my father's name before me, and my... Look me in the eye. I am looking you in the eye. It's Smilk. Cassius Smilk. Sounds convincing, admitted Mr. Yollop. Nobody would take the name of Cassius in vain, I am sure. As a sensible, discriminating thief, you would not deliberately steal a name like Cassius, now would you? Well, you see, they call me Cash for short, explained Smilk. That's something I can steal with a clear conscience. I perceive you are recovering your wits, Mr. Smilk. You appear to be a most ingenious rogue. Have you ever tried writing the book for a musical comedy? Oh, uh, what? A musical comedy, a forty-legged thing you see on Broadway. Mr. Smilk pondered. No, sir he replied, allowing himself a prideful leer. If I do say it as shouldn't, I'm an honest thief. Bless my soul, cried Mr. Yollop delightedly. You get brighter every minute. Perhaps you have at one time or another conducted a humorous column for a metropolitan newspaper? Well, I've done my share towards filling up the lost column, said Mr. Smilk modestly. Say, if we're going to keep up this talk fest much longer, I got to let my hands down. The blood's running out of them. What are you going to do with me? Keep me sitting here till morning? I'm glad you reminded me of it. I want to call the police. Well, I'm not hindering you, am I? In a way, yes. How can I call them and keep an eye on you at the same time? I'll tell you what I'll do, said Cassius Smilk obligingly. I'll take a message round to the police station for you. Ah, that gives me an idea. You shall telephone to the police for me. If my memory serves me well, 
Spring 3100 is the number. Or is it Spring 3100 that calls out the fire department? It would be very awkward to call out the fire department, wouldn't it? They'd probably come rushing around here and drown both of us before they found out word made a mistake and really wanted the police. All you have to do is to say to Central, I want a policeman. Right you are. That's what the telephone book says. Still, I believe, Spring 3100... The simplest way to get the police, broke in the burglar, not without hope, is to fire five shots out of a window as rapidly as possible. They always come for that. I see what you are after. You want them to come here and arrest me for violating the Sullivan Law. Don't you know it's against the law in New York to have a revolver on your premises or person? And what's more, you would testify against me, confound you. Also probably have me up for assault and battery. No, Mr. Smelt, your suggestion is not a good one. We will stick to the telephone. Now, if you will be kind enough to fold your arms tightly across your breast, that's the idea and arise slowly to your feet, I will instruct you. Yes, I know it is harder to get up without the aid of the hands than it was to go down, but I think you can manage it. Try again, if you please. Then, as Mr. Smilk sank sullenly back against the wall, apparently resolved not to budge, I'm going to count to three, Cassius. If you are not on your feet at the end of the count, I shall be obliged to do the telephoning myself. That suits me, said Cassius grimly. Do you object to the smell of powder? Huh? I don't like it myself, but I should, of course, open the windows immediately and air the room out. I'll get up, said Cassius, and did so, clumsily but promptly. Say, I... I believe you would shoot. You're just the kind of boob that would do a thing like that. I dare say I should miss you if I were to fire all five bullets, but that's neither here nor there. You're on your feet, so... By the way, are you sure this thing is loaded? It wouldn't make any difference if it wasn't. It would go off just the same. They always do when some darn fool idiot is pointing them at people. Don't be crotchety, Cassius, reproached Mr. Yollop. Now, if you'll just sidle around to the left, you will come in due time to the telephone over there on the desk. I shall not be far behind you. Sit down. Now, unfold your arms and lean both elbows on the desk. That's the idea. You might keep your right hand exposed sort of perpendicular from the elbow up. Take the receiver off the hook and... Oh, I know how to use a telephone, all right. Now, the main thing is to get central, said Mr. Yollop imperturbably. Sometimes it is very difficult to wake them after two o'clock a.m. Just jiggle it if she doesn't respond at once. Seems that jiggling wakes them when nothing else will. Mr. Yollop, very tall and square in his pajamas, stood behind the burly Mr. Smilk the dangling disc almost touching the latter's hunched-up shoulders. "'This is a devil of a note,' quoth Mr. Smilk, taking down the receiver, making a guy telephone to the police to come and arrest him. "'I wish I had thought to close that window while you were oars to combat,' complained Mr. Yollop, shivering. "'I'll probably catch my death of cold standing around here with almost nothing on. That wind comes straight from the North Pole. Doesn't she answer?' "'No.' "'Jiggle it.' "'I did jiggle it.' What? I said I jiggled it. Well, jiggle it again. Rottenest telephone service in the world, growled Mr. Smilk. When you think what we have to pay for telephones these days, you think, Hello. Hello. Got her? I thought I had for a second, but I guess it was somebody yawning. Awning? Say, if you'll hold that thing around so's I can talk at it, you'll hear what I'm saying. How do you expect me to... Hello. Central? Central. Hello. Where the hell have you been all? Hello. Well, can you beat it? I had her and she got away. No use trying to get her now, said Mr. Yollop resignedly. Hang up for a few minutes. It makes them stubborn when you swear at them, like mules. I just thought of something else you can do for me while we're waiting for her to make up her mind to forgive you. Come along over here and close this window you left open. Mr. Smilk, in closing the window, looked searchably up and down the fire escape peered intently into the street below, sighed profoundly, and muttered something that Mr. Yollop did not hear. I've got a fur coat hanging in that closet over there, Cassius. We will get it out. Carefully following Mr. Yollop's directions, the obliging rascal produced the coat and laid it upon the table in the center of the room. Turn your back, commanded the owner of the coat, and hold up your hands. 
Then, after he had slipped into the coat, Now, if I only had my slippers, but never mind. We won't bother about them. They're in my bedroom and probably lost under the bed. They always are, even when I take them off out in the middle of the room. Ah, nothing like a fur coat, Cassius. Do you know what cockles are? No, I don't. Well, never mind. Now, let's try Central again. Please remember that no matter how distant she is, she still expects you to look upon her as a lady. No lady likes to be sworn at at two o'clock in the morning. Speak gently to her. Call her Madame Mamselle. That always gets them. Makes them think if they keep their ears open, they'll hear something spicy. They general fall for deary, said Mr. Smilk, taking down the receiver. Be good enough to remember that you are calling from my apartment, said Mr. Yollop severely. Jiggle it. Mr. Smilk jiggled it. I guess she's still mad. Jiggle it slowly, tenderly, caressingly, sort of seductively. Don't be so savage about it. Hello, Central? What number do I have to call to get Spring 3100? I'm not trying to be fresh. Yes, that's what I want. I know the book says to tell you I want to call a policeman, but... Yes, there's a burglar in my apartment, and I want you to... What's that? I don't want to go to bed. Say, now you're getting fresh. You give me police. Tell her I've got you surrounded, whispered Mr. Yollop. Hello. Hello. Central. Jiggle it. Ah, mademoiselle, pardon my... Voice at the other end of the wire. Ring off. You've got the wrong number. This is police headquarters. Audible sound of distant receiver being slapped upon its hook. Gee whiz. Now we're up against it, mister. We'll be all night getting central again. Be patient, Cassius. Start all over again. Ask for the morgue this time. That will make her realize the grave danger you are in. Say, I wish you'd put that gun in your pocket. It makes the goose flesh creep out all over me. I'm not going to try to get away. Give you my word of honor I ain't. You seem to have some sort of idea that I don't want to be arrested. I confess I had some such idea, Cassius. Well, I don't mind a bit. Fact is, I've been doing my best to get nabbed for the last three months. You have? Sure. The trouble is with the police. They somehow seem to overlook me, no matter how open I am about it. I suppose I've committed twenty burglaries in the past three months, and I'll be cussed if I can make them understand. Take tonight, for instance. I clumb up that fire escape. This is the third floor, ain't it? I clumb up here with a big electric street light shining square on my back. Why, darn the luck, I had to turn my back on it because the light hurt my eyes. And there were two cops standing right down below here, talking about the crime wave being all bunk. Both of them arguing that the best proof that there ain't no crime wave is the fact that the jails are only half full, showing that the city is getting more and more honest all the time. I could hear them plain as anything. They were talking loud, so as to make everybody in this building rest easy, I guess. I stopped at the second floor and monkeyed with the window, hoping to attract their attention. Didn't work so I had to climb up another flight. This window of yours was up about six inches, so there wasn't anything for me to do but to raise it and come in. What I had in mind was to stick my head out after a minute or two and yell, thieves, police, and so on. Then before I knowed what was happening, you walks in, switches on the light, and comes straight over and bits me in the jaw. Does that look as if I was trying to avoid arrest? That's a very pretty story, Cassius and no doubt will make a tremendous hit with the jury. But what were you doing with a loaded revolver in your hand, and why were you so full of vituperation? I mean, what made you swear so when I... You let somebody hit you a wallop on the jaw, and bang your head against the wall, and dance on your ribs, and you'll cuss worse than I did. But about the revolver... Well, to be honest with you, I probably would have shot you if I hadn't been so low in my mind. I won't deny that. It's a sort of principle with us, you see... No self-respecting burglar wants to be captured by the party he's trying to rob. It's so damn mortifying. Besides, if that sort of thing happens to you, the police lose all kinds of respect for you and try to use you as a stool pigeon, if you know what that means. This is most interesting, I must say. I should like to hear more about it, Mr. Smilk. I dare say we can have quite a long and edifying chat while we are waiting for the police to respond to our call for help. In the meantime... You might see if you can get them now. Spring 3-100. As I was saying a while ago, 
Would you mind putting that gun in your pocket? While you've been chinning, Cassius, I have been making a most thrilling and amazing experiment. Do you call this thing under here a trigger? Yes. Don't monkey with it, you, you. I've been pressing it, very gently and cautiously, of course, to see just how near I can come to making it go off without actually... For God's sakes, cut that. Hey, Central, give me police headquarters again. Lively, please. Yes, it's life or death. Come on, mademoiselle, please. That's the way, complimented Mr. Yollop. My gosh, nobody ever wanted the police more than I do at this minute, gulped Mr. Smilk. He was perspiring freely. Hello, police headquarters. Hustle someone to, to... Over his shoulder to Mr. Yollop in a whisper. Quick, what's the number of this? 418 Sycamore Terrace. Into the transmitter. To 418 Sycamore Terrace, third floor front. Burglar, hurry up. Telephone. What's your name? Smilk to Yollop. What is my name? Crittenton Yollop. Smilk to telephone. Crittle yum yop. Telephone, languidly. Spell it. Ah, uh, go to. After me now. Y O L L O P. First name. Smilk prompted. C R I T T E N D E N. Telephone after interval. What floor? Third. Are you sure it's a burglar, or is it just a noise somewhere? It's a burglar. He's got me covered. What's that? I say, I've got him covered. Hurry up, or he'll blow my head off. Say, what is this? Get back to bed, you. You're drunk. I'm as sober as you are. Can't you get me straight? I tell you, I beat his head off. He's down and out, but... All right. We'll have someone there in a few minutes. Did you say yellop? No, I said hurry up. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The thing that's troubling me now, said Mr. Yollop, as Smilk hung up the receiver and twisted his head slightly to peek out of the corner of his eye, is how to get hold of my slippers. You've no idea how cold this floor is. If it's half as cold as the sweat I'm... We're likely to have a long wait, went on the other, frowning. It will probably take the police a couple of hours to find this building, with absolutely no clue except the number and the name of the street. I'll tell you what you might do, Mr. Scollop. Seeing as you won't trust me to go in and find your slippers for you, why don't you sit on your feet, take that big armchair over there, and... Splendid! By Jove, Cassius, you are an uncommonly clever chap. I'll do it. And then, when the police arrive, we'll have something for them to do. We'll let them see if they can find my slippers. That ought to be really quite interesting. There's something about you, said Mr. Smilk, not without a touch of admiration in his voice, that I simply can't help liking. That's what the wolf said to Little Red Riding Hood, if I remember correctly. However, I thank you, Cassius. In spite of the thump I gave you and the disgusting way in which I treated you, a visitor in my own house, you express a liking for me. It is most gratifying. Still, for the time being, I believe we can be much better friends if I keep this pistol pointed at you. Now, we'll do a little maneuvering. You may remain seated where you are. However, I must ask you to pull out the two lower drawers in the desk, one on either side of where your knees go. You will find them quite empty and fairly commodious. Now, put your right foot in the drawer on this side, and your left foot in the other one. Yes, I know it's quite a stretch, but I dare say you can manage it. Sort of recalls the old days when evildoers were put in the stocks, doesn't it? They seem to be quite a snug fit, don't they? If it is as difficult for you to extricate your feet from those drawers as it was to insert them, I fancy I'm pretty safe from a sudden and impulsive dash in my direction. Rather bright idea of mine, eh? I'm beginning to change my opinion of you announced Mr. Smilk. Mr. Yollop pushed a big upholstered library chair up to the opposite side of the desk, and after several awkward attempts, succeeded in sitting down, tailor fashion, with his feet neatly tucked away beneath him. I wasn't quite sure I could do it, said he, rather proudly. I suppose my feet will go to sleep in a very short time, but I am assuming, Cassius, that you are too much of a gentleman to attack a man whose feet are asleep. 
I wouldn't even attack you if they were snoring, said Cassius, grinning in spite of himself. Say, this certainly beats anything I've ever come up against. If one of my pals was to happen to look in here right now, and see me with my feet in these drawers, and you squatting on yours, well, I can't help laughing myself, and God knows I hate to. You were saying a little while ago, said Mr. Yollop, shifting his position slightly, that you rather fancy the idea of being arrested. Isn't that a little quixotic, Mr. Smelk? Huh? I mean to say, do you expect me to believe you when you say you relish being arrested? I don't care a whoop whether you believe it or not. It's true. Have you no fear of the law? Bless your heart, sir. I don't know how I'd keep body and soul together if it wasn't for the law. If people would only let the law alone, I'd be one of the happiest guys on earth. But, damn em, they won't let it alone. First, they put their heads together and frame up this blasted parole game on us. Just about the time we begin to think we're comfortably settled up the river, long comes some doggone home wrecker and gets us out on parole. Then we got to go to work and begin all over again. Sometimes, the way things are nowadays, it takes months to get back into the pen again. We got to live, ain't we? We got to eat, ain't we? Well, there you are. Why can't they leave us alone instead of driving us out into the cold, unfeeling world where we got to either steal or starve to death? There wouldn't be one-tenth as much stealing and murdering as there is if they didn't force us into it. Why, doggone it, I've seen some of the most cruel and pitiful sights you've ever heard of up there at Sing Sing. Fellers leading a perfectly honest life, suddenly chucked out into a world full of vice and inequity and forced, absolutely forced, into a life of crime. There they were, living a quiet, peaceful life, harming nobody, and bing, they wake up some morning and find themselves homeless. Do you realize what that means, Mr. Strumpet? It means, yollop, if you please. It means they got to go out and slug some innocent citizen, some poor guy that had nothing whatever to do with driving them out, and then, if they happen to be caught, they got to go through with all the uncertainty of a trial by jury, never knowing but what some pin-headed juror will stick out for acquittal and make it necessary to go through with it all over again. And more than that, they got to listen to the testimony of a lot of policemen and their own darn fool lawyers, trying to deprive them of their bread and butter, and the judge's instructions that nobody pays any attention to except the shorthand reporter and them just sitting there sort of helpless and not able to say a word in their own behalf because the law says they're innocent till they're proved guilty. Why, I tell you, Mr. Dewlap, it's heartbreaking, and all because some weak-minded smart aleck gets them paroled. As I was saying, the law's all right if it wasn't for the people that abuse it. This is most interesting, said Mr. Yollop. I've never quite understood why ninety per cent of the paroled convicts go back to the penitentiary so soon after they've been liberated. Of course, explained Mr. Smilk, there are a few that don't get back. That's because, in their anxiety to make good, they get killed by some inexperienced policeman who catches them coming out of somebody's window or, by the way, Cassius, let me interrupt you. Will you have a cigar? Nice pleasant way to pass an hour or two. Beg pardon? I was only saying. If you don't mind, I'll take one of these cigarettes. Cigars are a little too heavy for me. I have some very light-grade domestic. I don't mean in quality. I mean in weight. What's the sense of wasting a lot of strength holding a cigar in your mouth when it requires no effort at all to smoke a cigarette? Why, I got it all figured out scientifically. With the same amount of energy you expend in smoking one cigar, you could smoke between 30 and 40 cigarettes, and being sort of gradual, you wouldn't begin to feel half as fatigued as if you... Did I understand you to say scientifically, or was it satirically? I'm trying to use common everyday words, Mr. Shallop, said Mr. Smilk with dignity, and I wish you'd do the same. Ahem. Well, light up, Cassius. I think I'll smoke a cigar. When you get through with the matches, push them over this way, will you? Help yourself to those chocolate creams. There's a pound box of them at your elbow, Cassius. I eat a great many. They're supposed to be fattening. Help yourself. After lighting his cigar, Mr. Yollop inquired, By the way, since you speak so feelingly, I gather that you are a paroled convict. That's what I am. And the worst of it is, it ain't my first offense. I mean, it ain't the first time I've been paroled. To begin with, when I was somewhat younger than I am now, 
I was twice turned loose by judges on what they call suspended sentences. Then I was sent up for two years for stealing something or other. I forget just what it was. I served my time, and a little later on went up again for three years for holding up a man over in Brooklyn. Well, I got paroled out inside of two years, and for nearly six months I had to report to the police ever so often. Every time I reported, I had my pockets full of loot I'd snitched during the month, stuff the bulls were looking for in every pawn shop in town. But to save my soul, I couldn't somehow manage to get myself caught with the goods on me. Say, I'd give two years off of my next sentence if I could cross my legs for five or ten minutes. This is getting worse and worse, all the— You might try putting your left foot in the right-hand drawer and your right foot in the other one, suggested Mr. Yollop. Mr. Smilk stared. I've seen a lot of kidders in my time, but you certainly got them all skinned to death, said he. Mr. Yollop puffed reflectively for a while, pondering the situation. Well, suppose you remove one foot at a time, Cassius. As soon it is fairly well rested, put it back again, and then take the other one out for a spell. And so on. Half a loaf is better than no loaf at all. Smilk withdrew his left foot from its drawer and sighed gratefully. As I was saying, he resumed, if we could only put some kind of curb on these here tender-hearted boobs and boobesses, the world would be a much better place to live in. The way it is now, nine-tenths of the fellers up in Sing Sing never know when they'll have to pack up and leave, and it's a constant strain on the nerves, I tell you. There seems to be a well-organized movement to interfere with the personal liberty of criminals, Mr. Popup. These here sentimental reformers take it upon themselves to say whether a feller shall stay in prison or not. First, they come up there and pick out some poor helpless feller and say, It's a crime to keep a good-looking intelligent boy like you in prison, so we're going to get you out on parole and make an honest, upright citizen of you. We're going to get you a nice job. And so on and so forth. Well, before he knows it, he's out and has to put up a bluff of working for a living. Of course, he just has to go to stealing again. It makes him sore when he thinks of the good, honest life he was leading up there in the pen, with nothing to worry about, satisfactory hours, plenty to eat, and practically divorced from his wife without having to go through the mill. If my calculations are correct, more than 50% of the crime that's been committed these days is the work of paroled convicts who depended on the law to protect and support them for a given period of time. And does the law protect them? It does not. It allows a lot of pinheads to interfere with it. And what's the answer? A lot of poor devils are forced to go out and risk their lives trying to— Just a moment, please, interrupted Mr. Yollop. You are talking a trifle too fast, Cassius. Moderate your speed a little. Before we go any farther, I would like to be set straight on one point. Do you mean to tell me that you actually prefer being in prison? Well, now, that's a difficult question to answer, mused Mr. Smilk. Sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. It's sort of like being married, I suppose. Sometimes you're glad you're married, and sometimes you wish to God you wasn't. Of course, I've only been married three or four times, and I've been in the pen six times, one place or another, so I guess I'm not what you'd call an unbiased witness. I seem to have a leaning toward jail. About three to one in favor of jail, you might say, with the odds likely to be increased pretty shortly if all goes well. Do you mind if I change drawers? Eh? Oh, I see. Go ahead. Mr. Smelk put his right foot back into its drawer and withdrew the left. Get you right across this tenon on the back of your ankle, he said. Now, you take the daily life of the average laboring man, he went on earnestly. What does he get out of it? Nothing but expenses. The only thing that don't cost him something is work, and all the time he's at work, his expenses are going on just the same, piling up during his absence from home. Rent, food, fuel, light, doctor, liquor, clothes, shoes. Everything piling up on him while he's working for absolutely nothing between paydays. The only time he gets anything for his work is on payday. The rest of the time he's working for nothing, week in and week out. Say he works 44 hours a week. When does he get his pay? While he's working? Not much. He has to work overtime anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour, on his own time, mind you, standing in line to get his pay envelope. And then, when he gets it, what does he have to do? He has to go home and wonder how the hell he's going to get through the next week with nothing but car fare to go on after his wife has told him to come across. 
Now, you take a convict. He hasn't an expense in the world. Free grub, free bed, free doctor, free clothes. He could have free liquor if the keepers would let his friends bring it in. And his hours ain't any longer than any union man's hours. He don't have to pay dues to any labor union. He don't have to worry about strikes or strike benefits. He don't give a whoop what Gompers or anybody else says about Gary. And he don't care a darn whether the working man gets his beer or whether the revenue officers get it. He... Wait a second, please. Just as a matter of curiosity, Cassius, I'd like to know what your views are on prohibition. Are you thinking of asking me if I'll have something to drink? Inquired Mr. Smilk craftily. What has that to do with it? A lot, said Mr. Smilk, with decision. Do you approve of prohibition? I do, said the rogue, in moderation. Well, as soon as the police arrive, I'll open a bottle of scotch. In the meantime, go ahead with your very illuminating dissertation. I am beginning to understand why crime is so attractive, so alluring. I am almost able to see why you fellows like to go to the penitentiary. If you could only get shut up for a couple of years, Mr. Wallop, you'd appreciate just what has been done in the last few years to make us fellers like it. You wouldn't believe how much the reformers have done to induce us to come back as soon as possible. They give us all kinds of entertainment, free of charge. Three times a week we have some sort of a show, generally a band concert, a moving picture show, and a vaudeville show. Then, once a month, they bring up some crackin' good show right out of a Broadway theater to make us forget that it's Sunday and we'll have to go to work the next morning. Scenery and costumes and everything, and, and... Here, Mr. Smilk showed signs of blubbering, a weakness that suddenly gave way to the most energetic indignation. Why, doggone it, every time I think of what that woman done to me, I could bite a nail in two. If it hadn't been for... Woman? What woman? The woman that got me paroled out. She got I don't know how many people to sign a petition, saying I was a fine feller and all that kind of bunk, and all I needed was a chance to show the world how honest I am, and why, of course I was honest. How could I help being honest up there? What's eating the darn fools? The only thing you can steal up there is a nap, and you got to be mighty slick if you want to do that. They watch you so close. But do you know what's going on in this country right now, Mr. Popple? There's a regular organized band of lawbreakers operating from one end of the nation to the other. We're trying to bust it up, but it's a tough job. The best way to reform a reformer is to rob him. The minute he finds out he's been robbed, he turns over a new leaf and begins to beller like a bull about how rotten the police are. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, he quits his cussed interfering with the law and becomes a decent law-observant citizen. Our scheme is to get busy as soon as we've been turned loose, and while our so-called benefactors are still rejoicing over having snatched a brand from the burning, we up and show them the error of their ways. First offenders get off fairly easy. We simply sneak in and take their silver and some loose jewelry. The more hardened they are, the worse we treat them. Ringleaders sometimes get beat up so badly it's impossible to identify them at the morgue. But in time we'll smash the gang. And then if a feller goes up for ten, twenty, or even thirty years, he'll know there's no underhanded work going on, and he can settle down to an honest life. The only way to stop crime in this country, Mr. Yollop, is to, thank you, is to make everybody respect the law. And with conditions so pleasant and so happy in prison, I want to tell you there's nobody in the country that respects and admires the law more than we do especially us fellers that remember what the penitentiaries used to be like a few years ago when conditions were so tough that most of us managed to earn an honest living outside sooner than run the risk of getting sent up. He sighed deeply, then with a trace of real solicitude in his manner. Are your feet warm yet? Warm as toast. Your discourse, Cassius, has moved me deeply. Perhaps it would comfort you to call up police headquarters again and tell them to hurry along? Wouldn't be a bad idea said Mr. Smilk. He took down the receiver. Presently, Police headquarters? How about sending over to 418 Sagamore for that burglar I was speaking to you about recently? Sure, he's here yet. The same name I gave you earlier in the evening. Spell it yourself. You got it written down on a pad right there in front of you, haven't you? Say, if you don't get somebody around here pretty quick, I'm going to call up two or three of the newspaper offices and have them sent. All right. See that you do. Turning to Mr. Yollop, he said, 
The police are a pretty decent lot when you get to know them, Mr. Yollop. They do their share towards enforcing the law. They do their best to get us the limit. The trouble is, they got to fight tooth and nail against almost everybody that ain't on the police force, especially jurymen. There ain't a juryman in New York City that wants to believe a policeman on oath. He'd sooner believe a crook any day. And sometimes the judges are worse than the juries. A pal of mine, being in considerable of a hurry to get back home one very cold winter, figured that if he went up and pled guilty before a judge, he'd save a lot of time. Well, sir, the doggone judge looked him over for a minute or two, and suddenly, out of a clear sky, asked him if he had a family. And when he acknowledged, being an honest though ignorant guy, that he had a wife and three children, the judge said if he promised to go out and earn a living for them, he'd let him off with a suspended sentence. And before he had a chance to say he'd be damned if he'd make any such fool promise, the bailiff hustled him out the runway and told him to beat it. He had to go out and slug a poor old widow woman and rob her of all the money she'd saved since her husband died. Say, that reminds me. I've got a favor I'd like to ask of you, Mr. Yollop. I'm inclined to grant almost any favor you may ask, said Mr. Yollop sympathetically. I know how miserable you must feel, Cassius, and how hard life is for you. Do you want me to shoot you? No, I don't, exclaimed Mr. Smelk hastily. I want you to take my roll of bills and hide it before the police come. That ain't much to ask, is it? Bless my soul! How extraordinary! There's something over six hundred dollars in the roll, went on Cassius confidentially. It ain't that I'm afraid the cops will grab it for themselves, understand. But you see, it's like this. The first thing the judge asks you when you get arraigned is whether you've got the means to employ a lawyer. If you ain't, he appoints someone and it don't cost you a cent. Now, if I go down to the tombs with all this money, why, by gosh, it will cost me just that much to get sent to Sing Sing, because whatever you got in the shape of real money is exactly what your lawyer's fee will be, and it don't seem sensible to spend all that money to get sent up when you can obtain the same result for nothing. Ain't that so? It sounds reasonable, Cassius. You appear to be a thrifty as well as an honest fellow. But may I be permitted to ask what the devil you are doing with six hundred dollars on your person while actively engaged in the pursuit of your usual avocation? Why didn't you leave it at home? Home? My God, man, don't you know it ain't safe these days to leave a lot of money lying around the house? With all these burglaries going on? Not on your life. Even if I had had all this dough when I left home tonight, I wouldn't have taken any such chance as leaving it there. The feller I'm rooming with is figuring on turning over a new leaf. He's thinking of getting married for five or six months, and I don't think he could stand temptation. Do you mean to say you acquired your role after leaving home tonight, eh? To be perfectly honest with you, Mr. Mop-Up, I... Yollop, please. Yollop, I found this money in front of a theater uptown just after the police nabbed a friend of mine who had frisked some guy of his roll and had to drop it in a hurry. And you want me to keep it for you till you are free again, is that it? Just as soon as the trial is over and I get my sentence, I'll send a pal of mine around to you with a note, and you can turn it over to him. All I'm after is to keep some lawyer from getting... What would you say, Cassius, if I were to tell you that I am a lawyer? I'd say you're a darn fool to confess when you don't have to replied Mr. Smelk succinctly. Mr. Yollop chuckled. Heh. Well, I am not a lawyer. Nevertheless, I must decline to act as a depository for your obviously ill-gotten gains. Gee, that's tough, lamented Mr. Smelk. Wouldn't you just let me drop it behind something or other? That bookcase over there, say, and I'll promise to send for it some night when you're out. No use, Cassius, broke in Mr. Yollop firmly. I'm deaf to your entreaties. Permit me to paraphrase a very well-known line. None so deaf as him who will not hear. If I speak very slowly and distinctly, don't you think you could hear me if I was to offer to split the wad even with you? Fifty-fifty, no questions asked, inquired Cassius rather wistfully. See here, exclaimed Mr. Yollop irritably. You got me in this position, and I want you to get me out of it. While I've been squatting here listening to you, They've both gone to sleep, and I'm hanged if I can move them. I never would have dreamed of sitting on them if you hadn't put the thought into my head, confound you. Let him hang down for a while. That'll wake him up, suggested Mr. Smelk. Easier said than done, snapped the other. 
He managed, however, to get his benumbed feet to the floor and presently stood up on them. Mr. Smilk watched him with interest as he hobbled back and forth in front of the desk. They'll be all right in a minute or two. By Jove, I wish my sister could have heard all you've been saying about prisons and paroles and police. I ought to have had sense enough to call her. She's asleep at the other end of the hall. I hate women, growled Mr. Smilk. Ever since that pie-faced dame got me chucked out of Sing Sing. Say, let me tell you something else she'd done to me. She gave me an address somewhere up on the east side and told me to come and see her as soon as I got out. Well, I hadn't been out a week when I went up to see her one night, or, more strictly speaking, one morning about two o'clock. What do you think? It was an empty house with a for rent sign on it. I found out the next day she'd moved a couple of weeks before and had gone to some hotel for the winter because it was impossible to keep any servants while this crime wave is going on. The janitor told me she'd had three full sets of servants stole right out from under her nose by female bandits over on Park Avenue. I don't suppose I'll ever have another chance to get even with her. Everything all set to bind and gag her and maybe wrap her over the bean a couple of times and, say, can you beat it for rotten luck? She, she double-crossed. Chapter 3 of Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Someone at the door, the burglar announced after a moment. Mr. Yollop had failed to hear the tapping. You can't fool me, Cassius. It's an old trick, but it won't work. I've seen it done on the stage too many times to be caught napping by... There it goes again. Louder, please. He called with considerable vehemence, and was rewarded by a scarcely audible tapping, indicative not only of timidity, but of alarm as well. Say, he bawled, you'll have to cut out that spirit rapping if you want to come in. Use your nightstick. Ah, the police at last, cried Mr. Yollop. You better take this revolver now, Mr. Smilk, he added hastily. I won't want him to catch me with a weapon in my possession. It means a heavy fine or imprisonment. He shoved the pistol across the desk. They wouldn't believe me if I said it was yours. A sharp, penetrating rat-a-tat on the door. Mr. Smilk picked up the revolver. You bet they wouldn't, said he. If I swore on a stack of Bibles I let a boob like you take it away from me, they'd send me to Matawan, and God knows— Come in, called out Mr. Yollop. The door opened, and a plump, dumpy lady in a pink peignoir her front hair done up in curl papers stood revealed on the threshold blinking in the strong light goodness gracious crinton she cried irritably don't you know what time of night it she broke off abruptly as mr smilk with a great clatter yanked his remaining foot from the drawer and arose overturning the swivel chair in his haste well for the love of oozed from his gaping mouth suddenly he turned his face away and hunched one shoulder up as a sort of shield it's long past three o'clock, went on the newcomer severely. I'm sorry to interrupt the conference, but I do think you might arrange for an appointment during the day, sir. My brother has not been well, and if ever a man needed sleep and rest in regular hours, he does. Crittenden, I wish you— Cassius, interrupted Mr. Yollop urbanely. This is my sister, Mrs. Champney. I want you to repeat. Turn around here, can't you? What's the matter with you? Don't order me around like that muttered Mr. Smilk, still with his face averted. I've got the gun now, and I'll do as I damn please. You can't talk to me like— Goodness! Who is this man? cried the lady, stopping short to regard the blasphemer with shocked, disapproving eyes. And what is he doing with a revolver in his hand? Give me that pistol, at once, commanded Mr. Yollop. Hand it over! Not on your life, cried Mr. Smilk triumphantly. He faced Mrs. Champney. Take off them rings, you. Put them here on the desk. Lively now, and don't yelp. Do you get me? Don't yelp. Mrs. Champney stared unblinkingly, speechless. Put up your hands, Yollop, ordered Mr. Smilk. Why? Why, it's Ernest. Ernest Wilson, she gasped incredulously. Then, with a little squeak of relief, don't pay any attention to him, Crinton. He is a friend of mine. Don't you remember me, Ernest? I am... You bet your life I remember you, the burglar said softly, almost purringly. Ernest, your grandmother, 
cried Mr. Yollop, jerking the disc first one way and then the other in order to catch the flitting dialogue. His name is Smilk. Cassius Smilk. Nothing of the sort, said Mrs. Champney sharply. It's Ernest Wilson, isn't it, Ernest? Take off them rings, was the answer she got. What is this man doing here, Crittenton? demanded Mrs. Champney, paying no heed to Smilk's command. He's a burglar, replied Mr. Yollop. I guess you'd better take off your rings, Alice. Do you mean to tell me, Ernest Wilson, that you've gone back to your evil ways after all I— I say, Cassius, cried Mr. Yollop, is this the woman you wanted to bind and gag and— and— Yes, and wrap over the bean, finished Mr. Smilk, as the speaker considerately refrained. Wrap over the— What? inquired Mrs. Champney, squinting. The bean, said Mr. Smilk, with emphasis. I can't imagine what has come over you, Ernest. You were such a nice, quiet model prisoner, one of the most promising I ever had anything to do with. The authorities assured me that you— Do you mean to tell me that you entered this apartment for the purpose of robbing it? Don't answer. I don't want to hear your voice again. You have given me the greatest disappointment of my life. I trusted you, Ernest. I had faith in you, and— and now I find you here in my own brother's apartment, of all places in the world, still pursuing your— Well, you went and moved away on me, broke in Smilk wrathfully. That's right, Alice, added Mr. Yollop. You went and moved on him. He told me that just before you came in. You may as well understand right now, Ernest Wilson, that I shall never intercede for you again, said Mrs. Chantley sternly. I shall let you rot in prison. I am through with you. You don't deserve— Are you going to take off them rings, or have I got to— Would you rob your benefactress? demanded the lady. Every time I think of all you robbed me of, I— I— began Mr. Smilk shakily. Don't blubber, Cassius, said Mr. Yollop consolingly. You see, my dear Alice, Mr. Smilk thinks, and maintains, that you did him a dirty trick when you had him turned out into the wicked, dishonest world. He was living on the fat of the land up there in Sing Sing, seeing motion pictures and plays and so forth, without a worry in the world, with union hours and union pay, no one depending. What nonsense are you talking? How could he have union pay in a penitentiary, Crittenton? Don't interrupt me, please. However, I will explain that he was just as well off at the end of the week as any union laborer is, and no street car fare to pay besides. Free food? Fuel, lodging, divorce, music. I forgot to mention baseball, interrupted Mr. Smilk. And once in a while, an electrocution to break the monotony, to say nothing of a jailbreak every now and then. Say, you'll have to get a move on, Mrs. Champney. God, will I ever forget that name? Because we're expecting the police here before long. I've changed my mind about having you hold your hands up, Mr. Yollop. You made me telephone for the police to come around and arrest me. Now I'm going to make you bind and gag this lady. I can't very well do it myself and keep you covered at the same time. And while I ought to give you a wallop on the jaw, same as you done to me, I ain't going to do it. You can scream if you want to, ma'am. Yell bloody murder and police and everything. It's all the same to me. Go ahead and— It is not my intention to do anything of the kind, announced the lady haughtily. But I want to tell you one thing, Crittenden Yollop. If you attempt to gag and bind me, I'll bite and scratch, even if you are my own brother. Mr. Yollop pondered. I think, Cassius, if you don't mind, I'd rather you hit me a good sound wallop on the jaw. I'll tell you what I'll do, modified Mr. Smilk. I'll lock you in that closet over there, Mr. Yollop, so's you won't have to watch me wrap her over the bean. After I've gone through the apartment, I'll— Would you strike a woman, Ernest Wilson? cried Mrs. Champney. See here, Smilk said Mr. Yollop. I cannot allow you to strike my sister. If you so much as lay a finger on her, I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. Oh, you will, will you? sneered Mr. Smilk. If you want to go ahead and rob this apartment in a decent orderly way, all well and good. My sister and I will personally conduct you through— We will do nothing of the kind, blazed Mrs. Champney. I'd like to see you try to thrash me within an inch. And what's more, went on the lady, I will see that you go up for twenty years, Ernest Wilson, you degraded, ungrateful wretch. Smilk's face brightened. He even allowed himself a foxy grin. Now you're beginning to talk sense, said he. 
sit down ernest and let me talk quietly to you said mrs champney i'm sure you don't quite realize what you are doing you need moral support you are not naturally a bad man you are you going to take them rings off peaceably muttered smelt a hunted look leaping into his eyes i am not said she speak a little louder both of you complained mr yollop this contraption of mine doesn't seem to catch what you are saying jiggle it said smilk brightly how long ago did you telephone for the police crittenden how long ago was it cassius only about an hour we got plenty of time to finish up before they get here do you think it will go harder with you cassius if they find mrs champney bound and gagged and everything scattered about the floor and the jewelry in your possession it might help said cassius the trouble is you never can tell what a damn fool jury will do especially to a guy with a record like mine you had a splendid record up at sing sing announced the lady that's why i had so little trouble you don't get me said cassius lugubriously my record is a bad one i've been paroled twice that's bound to influence most any jury against me wouldn't surprise me a bit if they recommended clemency as the saying is and after all that's been done to keep me out of the pen the judge is likely to up and give me the minimum sentence no he went on i guess i'll have to rap somebody over the bean i'd sooner it as you ma'am on account of the way you forced me into a life of crime when i was leading an honest happy carefree why the man's insane crittenden positively insane he doesn't know what he's for god's sakes don't start anything like that barked cassius that would be the limit you don't understand alice said mr yollop kindly the poor fellow merely wants to have the law enforced he says it's a crime the way the law is being violated these days or words to that effect eh cassius yes sir there are more honest law-abiding men up in sing sing right at this minute than there are in the whole city of new york or words to that effect as you say mr yollop the surest and quickest way to make an honest man of a crook is to send him to the pen i don't know as i've ever heard of a robbery or a hold-up or anything like that up there the way he rambles crittenden is proof it would be just like her to go on the stand and swear i'm batty snarled cassius i got to do something about it mr yollop she's going to interfere with the law again sure as god made little apples i can see it coming i'm going to count three ma'am if you don't let mr yollop start to tying you up with that muffler of his hanging over there in the closet by the time i've said three i'm going to shoot him i hate to do it cause he's a fine feller and don't deserve to be shot on account of any darn fool woman i suppose you know the law provides a very unpleasant penalty for murder said mrs champney but her voice quavered disloyally one began cassius ominously do you really mean it she cried and glanced frantically over her shoulder to the open closet door two replied cassius count slowly implored mr yollop you you may tie my hands crittenden chattered the lady you mustn't bite or scratch him warned cassius sixty seconds later mrs champney stood before the burglar her wrists securely bound behind her back will you gag her or must i demanded cassius i will give you my word of honor not to scream faltered the crumpling lady it ain't the screaming i object to said smilk it's the talking you've done too much talking already ma'am if you hadn't talked so much i wouldn't be here tonight. have you a hanky cassius inquired mr yollop i refuse to have that disgusting wretch's filthy handkerchief stuffed into my mouth cried mrs champney with spirit mr yollop chuckled good gracious crittenden what is there to laugh at i was thinking of your roll of bills cassius said mr yollop not on your life said cassius who evidently had had the same thought she'd swallow it i suppose we'd better repair to your room alice where we can obtain the necessary articles mr smilk will naturally want to ransack your room anyhow so we'll be saving quite a bit of time and the police are likely to be here any minute now you forgot to take your rings off ma'am reminded mr smilk that's got to be attended to first of all take em off mr yollop and put em here on the desk a moment later he dropped the three costly rings into his coat pocket now said he lead the way i'll be right behind you with the gun no monkey business now remember that it was not long before mrs champney properly gagged 
found herself lashed to a rocking chair in the charming little bedchamber occupying so to speak a select position from which to observe the hasty but skilful operations of her recalcitrant beneficiary she watched him empty her innovation trunk the drawers in her bureau and the closet in which her choicest gowns were hanging he did it very thoroughly the floor was strewn with lingerie hats shoes slippers gloves stockings furs frocks over which he trod with professional disdain he broke open her small little jewelry case and took therefrom a glittering assortment of rings bracelets and earrings a horseshoe pin a gorgeous crescent and a string of pearls a platinum and diamond wrist watch an acorn watch a diamond collar several bars of diamonds rubies and emeralds and odds and ends of feminine vanity all without so much as pausing to classify them beyond the mere word junk all of this dazzling fortune he stuffed carelessly into his pocket during the proceedings mr yollop stood obediently over against the wall his hands aloft his back towards the rummaging cassius what's in that room over there demanded the burglar pointing to a closed door for obvious reasons there was no response he scowled for a second or two, and then, striding over to Mr. Yollop, seized him by the shoulder and turned him about face. Then he repeated the question. That's the room where my niece sleeps. A little ten-year-old child, Cassius. You will oblige me by not disturbing— Is her hair bobbed? broke in Mr. Smilk. Certainly not. She wears it long. Beautiful golden tresses, Smilk. Particularly beautiful when she's asleep, spreading out all over the pillow like a silken— an audible muffled groan came from the occupant of the rocking chair heard only by mr smilk his gaze went first to the purpling face of mrs champney then to the door then back to the lady again for your sake mr yollop i won't clip it he announced i know i ought to but well i guess it's about time we went back to the library again the cops will be along in a couple of minutes now according to my calculations I can tell almost to a minute how long it takes them to get around to where a burglary has been committed. If you tell me where you think your slippers are, we'll stop and get them on the way. Leaving Mrs. Champney seated alone and helpless in the midst of the confusion, Smilk marched Mr. Yollop to his bedroom and then up the hall to the scene of the first encounter. It seems sort of a pity not to get away with all this stuff, said the burglar, rattling the objects in his pocket. It ain't professional. I'm beginning to change my mind about being arrested, Mr. Yollop. I know a girl that would be tickled to death to have these things to splash around in. She's a peach of a... Say, I believe I'll use your telephone again. I'll call her up and see how she feels about it. If she says she'd like to have him, I'll make my getaway before the cops... You will find the telephone directory hanging on the end of the desk, Cassius, said Mr. Yollop graciously. He was seated in the big armchair again wriggling his toes delightedly in the cozy fleece-lined bedroom slippers but are you not afraid she will be annoyed if you get her out of bed this time of night it's after three i know the number yes she'll be sore at first but hello central he lowered his voice almost to a whisper so that mr yollop could not hear give me plaza zero zero one zero zero right turning to mr yollop he announced as he sank back into the chair comfortably it's an apartment We'll probably have quite a long wait. I found it takes some little time to wake the head of the house and get him to the phone. And say, he's the darndest grouch I ever tackled. Get sore as a crab. But we've got him where we want him. He knows darned well if he kicks up a row, she'll quit and his wife couldn't get anybody in her place for love or money these days. I was saying only the other night, again lowering his voice, is this Plaza 00100? I want to speak to Yelga, please. Raising his voice considerably, Here now, cut that out. Well, it is important. Of course I know what time of night it is. Yes, it's a damned outrage and all that, but what? All right, I'll hold the wire. Tell her to hustle, will you? I wish I had shot you, Smilk, when I had the chance, said Mr. Yollop sadly. This is abominable, atrocious. Getting a man out of bed at half past three. It's unspeakable, Smilk. She's a light sleeper, mused Mr. Smilk aloud, dreamily. What say? Don't bother me. I'm thinking. Mr. Yollop waited a moment. What are you thinking about, Cassius? Cassius started. Eh? I was thinking about the last time I had breakfast at Mr. Johnson's apartment. It was that terrible cold morning the first of last week. 
By gosh, how that girl can cook. Six fried eggs and... Yes? Hello? Plaza, zero, zero, one hundred. Yoga's not in yet. Smilk, sharply. What's that? She's out. Smilk, sharply. Out? Come off. You can't put that sort of stuff over me. I tell you she's not in, that's all. And say, don't call up this apartment again at... Say, it's nearly four o'clock. She must be in. She's not in, I tell you. She went out last evening with her young man. One of the other maids stuck her head out of her door and told me. Smilk, with fallen jaw. What? What time do you expect her in? I don't know, and I don't give a damn, so long as she's here in time to get breakfast. Smilk, furiously. Hey, you go back there and bust into her room. Hear what I say? Better take a club or a gun or something. Go to thunder. Smilk, flinching, as he jerked the receiver away from his ear. Lord, I bet he put that telephone out of whack. He sagged a little as he slowly hung up the receiver. For a moment he stared desolately at Mr. Yollop, and then recovering himself gradually, rushed with ever-increasing velocity into the most violent hurricane of profanity that ever was centered upon the frailty of woman. Running out of expletives, he at last subsided into an ominous calm. For two cents, groaned he, I'd blow my head off. He gazed hungrily at the revolver. I never dreamed there were so many cuss words in the world, gasped Mr. Yollop, blinking. There ain't half enough, announced Mr. Smilk in a faraway voice. Put that pistol down, roared Mr. Yollop. What are you going to do, shoot yourself? It would save an awful lot of trouble, said Mr. Smilk. The deuce it would. My servants would be a week cleaning up after you, and you'd probably ruin this meshed rug. Besides, confound you, the police would think I shot you. Give me that pistol. Give it to me, I say. You can come in here and rob to your heart's content, but I'm damned if I'll allow you to commit suicide here. That's a little too thick, Smilk. Why the dickens should you worry about that infernal jade? Aren't you going to the penitentiary for fifteen or twenty years? Aren't you— You're right. You're right, broke in Cassius, drawing a deep breath. I guess I had kind of a brainstorm. It was the jewels that done it. Funny how a feller gets the feeling that he just has to give diamonds and pearls to his girl. It came over me all of a sudden. The only things I ever gave that girl was a moleskin coat, a sable collar and muff, and a gold mesh bag with seventy-eight dollars and a lace handkerchief in it. For a minute or two, I was tempted to give her diamonds and rubies. Oh, well, I guess I've had my lesson. Never again. Never again, Mr. Yollop. I'm off, women, from now on. Here's the gun. If the police try to hang it on you, I'll swear it's mine. Listen, there's the elevator stopping at this floor. It's them. Before we let them in, I'd like to tell you I've never had a more interesting evening in my whole life. What's more, I never saw a man like you. You got me guessing. You're either the gosh darndest fool living, or else you're the slickest confidence man outside of captivity. Which are you? That's what's eating me. I'm both, said Mr. Yollop, picking up the revolver. That ain't possible, said Mr. Smilk. Oh, yes, it is. I'm a milliner, Cassius. I know you're a millionaire, but that don't... I said milliner. Run a mill of some kind? No, I make hats for women. As the incredulous burglar opened... Chapter 4 of Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The case of the state versus Cassius Milk, charged with burglary, was finally set for trial the second week in February, just one year, one month, and eleven days after his arrest in the apartment of Crittenden Yollop. There had been, it appears, a slight delay in getting round to his case. The dockets in all parts of General Sessions were more or less clogged by the efforts of ex-convicts to get back into the penitentiary. Also, there were a great many murder cases that kept bobbing up every now and then for continuance on one plea or another to the disgust of the harassed judges, to say nothing of the retrials made necessary by the jurors who listened more attentively to the lawyers who summed up than they did to the witnesses who were under oath to tell nothing but the truth. Cassius, on arraignment, had pleaded not guilty according to the ancient ritual of his profession. 
notwithstanding his evident and expressed desire to return to a haven of peace and luxury he was far too conscientious a criminal to violate the soundest it may well be said the elemental law of his craft by pleading guilty to anything it was a matter of principle with him circumstances had nothing to do with it the instant he found himself in court he reverted to type somewhat gleefully setting about to make as much trouble as possible he adhered to the principle that no criminal is adequately punished unless the people are made to pay for the privilege of suppressing him the only way to make the people respect the law he contended is to let them understand that it costs money to enforce it besides crime has a certain clearly established dignity that must be reckoned with the world thinks a great deal less of you if after you have violated the law you also refuse to fight it take the judge for instance i quote smilk what sort of an opinion does he have of you if you slide up to the little gate with your tail between your legs and plead guilty why he hardly notices you he has to put on his spectacles in order to see you at all and he doesn't even have to look at the statute book to refresh his memory as to the minimum penalty for larceny or whatever it is and the way the assistant district attorney looks at you and the bailiffs too but put up a fight and see what happens the whole blamed work sits up and takes notice the judge looks over his spectacles and says to himself by gosh he's a tough-looking bird that guy is the district attorney goes around telling everybody in a whisper that you're a desperate character the clerk of the court the stenographer and all the bailiffs sort of wake up and act busy the men waiting to be examined for jobs on the jury begin to fidget and wonder whether the judge is a crab or a nice decent feller what'll let em off when they tell him they got sickness in the family and all of em hating you worse than poison because you didn't plead guilty he was remanded for trial within two weeks after his arrest the court finding him penniless announced he would appoint counsel to defend him whereupon smilk sauntered back to the tombs with a light heart confident that his sojourn there would be brief and that march at the very latest would see him snugly settled in his rent-free food-free landlordless home on the hudson entertainment for man and beast provided without discrimination crime no object first of all his lawyer unexpectedly got a job to represent a shady lady in a sensational breach of promise suit that drew weekly postponements over a period of five months and finally died a natural death out of court some time in june this resulted in his lawyer becoming so affluent that it wasn't necessary for him to bother with cassius so he withdrew from the case after some delay another lawyer was appointed to defend him and things began to look up but by this time the dockets had become so jammed with unrelented dilemmas and the summer heat was so intense that the new lawyer informed him he couldn't possibly sandwich him in unless he would consent to change his plea to guilty contending that the combination of humility and humidity would go a long ways toward softening the judge but cassius sturdily refused to cheapen himself in the meantime new crimes had been committed by countless gentlemen of leisure the tombs was full of men clamoring for attention and there was an undetected waiting list outside that stretched all the way from the battery to the lower extremities of yonkers the principal witness mr crittenden yollop did his best to behave nobly he thrice postponed a business trip to paris in order to be within reach when cassius needed him then in the fall when things looked most propitious for a speedy termination of smilk's suspense the millinery business took a sudden and alarming turn for the worse and mr yollop fell into the hands of the specialists he had his teeth x-rayed his sinuses probed his eyes examined his stomach sounded his intestines visited his nerves tampered with his blood tested his kidneys explored his heart observed his ears inspected his gallstones if he had any shifted his last will and testament drawn up his funeral practically arranged for all by different scientists and then was ordered to go off somewhere in the country and play golf for his health he went to hot springs virginia and inside of two weeks contracted the golf disease in its most virulent form he got it so bad that other players looked upon him as a scourge and avoided him even to the point of self-sacrifice it was said of him that when he once got on a green it was next to impossible to get him off of it but all this is neither here nor there 
Suffice to say that shortly after his return to New York, Mr. Yollop paid a more or less clandestine visit to the tombs where he saw Cassius. This was the week before the trial was to open. He found the crook in a disconsolate frame of mind. Don't call me Yollop, he managed to convey to the prisoner. I gave another name to the jailer or whatever he is. Is it Jailbird? It wouldn't look right for the prosecuting witness to come down here to see you. They think I'm your brother-in-law. Smilk glowered. Has your hearing improved any? he inquired after locating the disc. No, of course not. Then, said the prisoner, I can't tell you what I think of you without the whole damn jail hearing me, so I guess you'd better beat it. Splendid! That's just the way I might have expected you to talk to your brother-in-law. Well, what do you want, anyhow? I don't think that's a very nice way to speak to a— Come on, what do you want to see me about? Get it over with and get out. It can't help my case any if it gets nosed around that you come down here to pay a friendly visit to me. I'm having a hard enough time as it is. It's getting so it's almost impossible to get back into the pen even— See here, Cassius, I've been giving your case a great deal— of serious thought. I want to help you out of this scrape if there is any way to do it. That's just what I thought you'd be up to, groaned Cassius. What's got into you? Have you soured on life, or what is it? Not a bit of it. You do not get my meaning. Your wife came to see me yesterday afternoon. My wife? Which one? A tallish one with a flat nose. Yes, I know her. What did she want? She asked me to be as easy on you as I could, on account of the children. How many children has she got now? Four, she informs me. The youngest is two and a half. Cassius seemed to be doing a bit of mental arithmetic. He pondered well before speaking. Then he said, Did she say whose children? I assume them to be yours, Cassius. Smilk grinned. Well, I guess she's adopted a couple since the last time I saw her, which was five years ago last spring. I've been married twice since then, so she wants you to go easy on me, eh? She seems to think that if I intercede for you, the judge will let you off with a suspended sentence, and then you can go to work and support your family. It's time she woke up, snarled Smilk. I've been at large quite a bit in the last ten years, and if she can prove that I ever supported her, why, darn her hide, what right has she got to accuse me of supporting her when she knows I've never been guilty of doing it? She knows as well as anything that she supported me on three different occasions when I was out for a month or two at a stretch. I will say this for her. She supported me better than the other two did. A lot better. And it's her own fault her nose is flat. If she'd stood still that time. But I'm not going to discuss family matters with you, Mr. Yow. Shh! Easy! It's all right. He ain't listening. What is your brother-in-law's name? In a whisper. I never had but one name for him and it's something I wouldn't call you for anything in the world, said Smilk. Let's make it, Bill. You ain't going to do what she asked, are you? You ain't going to do a dirty trick like that, are you, Bill? I thought I would come down and talk the matter over with you, Cash. I am in quite a dilemma. She says if I don't help you out of this scrape, she and all your children will haunt me to my dying day. It sounds rather terrible, doesn't it? I can't think of anything worse, acknowledged Cassius solemnly. She asked me what I thought your sentence would be, and I told her I doubted very much whether you'd get more than a year or so, in view of all the extenuating circumstances. That is to say, your self-restraint and all that when you had not only the jewels but the revolver as well. That seemed to cheer her up a bit. You made a ten strike that time, Bill, said Smilk, his face brightening. I didn't give you credit for being so clever. If she thinks I'll be out in a year or two, maybe she'll be satisfied to keep her nose out of my affairs. If you had told her I was dead sure to go up for twenty years or so, she'd come and camp over there in the criminal courts building and just raise particular hell with everything. Mr. Yollop turned his face away. I'm sorry to bring bad news to you, Cash, but she's made up her mind to attend your trial next Monday. She's going to bring the children in. He was interrupted by the string of horrific oaths that issued pianissimo through the twisted lips of the prisoner. After a time, Cassius interrupted himself to murmur weakly, If she does that, I'm lost. We've got to head her off somehow, Mr. Er, Bill. I don't see how it can be managed. She has a perfect right to attend the pro- Wait a minute, Bill, broke in the other eagerly. I got an idea. 
If you give her that role of mine, maybe she'll stay away. What role are you talking about? My role of bills. You remember, don't you? My good man, I haven't got your roll of bills. And besides, I couldn't put myself in the position of, of, er, what is it you call it? Tinkering with witnesses to defeat the ends of justice. But she ain't a witness, Bill. You couldn't possibly get in wrong. What's more, it's my money, and I got a right to give it to my wife, ain't I? Ain't I got a right to give money to my own wife, or to one of my wives, strictly speaking, and to my own children, ain't I? That isn't the point. I refuse to be a party to any such game. We need not discuss it any farther. As I said before, I haven't got your roll of bills, and if I had it, I— Oh, yes, you have. You got it right up there in your apartment. I stuck it away behind a— Stop! Not another word, Cassius. I don't want to know where it is. If you persist in telling me, I'll— I'll ask the judge to let you off with the lightest sentence he can. Oh, Lord, you wouldn't do that, would you? Yes, I would. What do you mean by secreting stolen property in my apartments? I didn't steal it. I found it, I tell you. Bosh! Hope I may die if I didn't. Well, it may stay there till it rots, so far as I'm concerned. No danger of that, said Smilk composedly. A friend of mine is coming around some night soon to get it. What else did she say? Eh? What else did my wife say? Oh, well, among other things, she wondered if it would be possible to get an injunction against the court to prevent him from depriving her of her only means of support. She says everybody is getting injunctions these days, and— Bosh, said Smilk, but not with conviction. An anxious, inquiring gleam lurked in his eyes. Mr. Yollop continued. I told her it was ridiculous, and it is. Then she said she was going to see your lawyer and ask him to put her on the witness stand to testify that you are a good, loyal, hard-working husband, and that your children ought to have a father's hand over them, and a lot more like that. She tried that once before, and the court wouldn't let her testify, said Smilk. But anyhow, I'll tell my lawyer to kick her out of the office if she comes round there offering to commit perjury. I rather fancy she has considered that angle, Cassius. She says if she isn't allowed to testify, she's going to attempt suicide right there in the courtroom. By gum, she's a mean woman, groaned Smilk. I'm obliged to agree with you, said Mr. Yollop, compressing his lips as a faraway look came into his eyes. If I live to be a thousand years old, I'll never forget the way she talked to me when I finally succeeded in telling her I was busy and she would have to excuse me. It was something appalling. Course, I suppose I got myself to blame, lamented Cassius ruefully. I don't know how many times I come near to doing it and didn't because I was so darn chicken-hearted. I have decided, Cash, that you ought to go up for life, or for thirty years at least. So when I go on the stand, I intend to do everything in my power to secure the maximum for you. At first, I was reluctant to aid you in your efforts to lead a life of ease and enjoyment, but recent events have convinced me that you are entitled to all that the law can give you. It won't do much good if she's to sit there in the courtroom, sniveling and looking heartbroke, with a pack of half-starved kids hanging on her. Like as not, she won't give them anything to eat for two or three days, so they'll look the part. I remember two of them kids fairly well. The Lord knows I used to take all kinds of risks to provide clothes and all sorts of luxuries for them, and for her, too. I used to give them bicycles and skates and gold watches. Yes, sir, we had Christmas regularly once a month, and she never was without fur neck pieces and muffs and silk stockings and everything. The trouble with that woman is she can't stand poverty. She just keeps on hoping for the day to come when she can wear all sorts of finery and jewels again, even if I have to go to the penitentiary for it. All this comes of being too good a provider, Bill. You spoil em. Mr. Yollop was thinking, so Cassius, after waiting a moment, scratched his head and ventured. That guy's beginning to fidget, Bill. I guess your time's about up. What are you thinking about? I was thinking about your other wives. How many did you say you have? Three, all told. The other two don't bother me much. Haven't you ever been divorced from any of them? Not especially. Why? Where do the other two live, and what are their names? Elsie Morton and Jenny Finch. I mean, those are their married names. I use a different alias every time I get married, you see. Of course, my first wife, the one you met, her name is Smilk. I married her when I was young and not very smart. 
Elsie lives in Brooklyn, and Jenny keeps the delicatessen up on the west side. Do they know where you are? I don't think so. I forgot to tell them I was out on parole last year. And they have never been divorced from you? No, they couldn't prove anything on me as long as I was locked up in the penitentiary. Does either one of them know about the other two? I should say not. What do you think I am? Don't lose your temper, Cassius. I am trying to think of some way to help you, and I believe I see a ray of hope. You were regularly married to Elsie and Jenny, I mean, by a minister, and so on? Sure. They both got their marriage certificates. I always believe in doing... Chapter 5 of Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There were quite a number of people in the courtroom when the case of the State versus Smilk was called. It was a bitterly cold day outside, and considerable of an overflow from the quarters had seeped into the various courtrooms. But little delay was experienced in obtaining a jury. The regular panel was stuck, with a few exceptions. Only one member was able to declare that he had formed an opinion, and he did not form it until after he had had a good look at the prisoner, although he did not say so. Two were challenged by counsel, and one got off because he admitted that he was acquainted with a man who used to be connected with the district attorney's office. He couldn't think of his name. Smilk's attorney succeeded in executing a very clever piece of strategy at the outset. No sooner had the jury been sworn then he ordered the bailiffs to crowd three or four more chairs alongside his table, and then blandly invited a considerable portion of the audience to take their seats inside the railing. The persons indicated included a tall, shabbily dressed woman and seven ragged, pinched children, ranging in years from twelve down to three. Immediately the prosecution fell into the trap. Two agitated assistant district attorneys jumped to their feet, and barked out an objection to the presence of the accused's wife and family on the inside of the fence, and the court promptly sustained them. He also said some very sharp and caustic things to Smilk's lawyer. Mrs. Smilk and her bewildered seven patiently resumed their seats in the front row of spectators, but not until after a four-year-old girl, surreptitiously pinched, had caused a mild sensation by piping, I want my daddy! I want my daddy! Smilk cringed, and it was quite apparent to close observers that he was having great difficulty in suppressing his emotions. The first witness for the prosecution was Crittenton Yollop, milliner, aged forty-four. A more thorough examination by the state would have disclosed the fact that he was six feet tall, spare, slightly bald, beardless, well manicured, and faultlessly attired. "'State your name and occupation, please,' said the state's attorney, advancing a few paces toward the witness stand. My name is Crittenton Yollop. I am in the millinery business. Where do you reside? 418 Sigamore Terrace. In an apartment? A little louder, if you please. The state, raising its voice. Repeat the question, Mr. Stenographer. Stenographer, leaning forward a little. In an apartment? Yes. Were you living in this apartment on the 18th of December, 1919? I was. Was that apartment entered by a burglar on the date mentioned? It was. The state, casually, Will you be so good as to glance around the courtroom and state whether you see and recognize the man who entered and robbed your apartment? Yollop, pointing. Yes, that is the man. You are sure about that? I beg pardon? The state, patiently. Repeat the question, Mr. Stenographer. Stenographer, patiently. Are you sure about that? Certainly. Now, Mr. Yollop, I'm going to ask you to tell the jury, in your own words, exactly what occurred in your apartment on the morning of December 18th. Speak slowly and distinctly, and face the jury. Mr. Yollop, assisted to some extent by the gentleman conducting the examination, related the story of the crime, dwelling with specific earnestness upon the dastardly, brutal manner in which Smilk forced him, at the point of a revolver, to bind and gag and otherwise maltreat the woman who had befriended him and whose jewels he was preparing to make off with when the police arrived. He carefully avoided any allusion to certain portions of the lengthy and illuminating dialogue that had taken place between him and Smilk. 
He said nothing of the unexampled behavior of the intruder in telephoning for the police, or the kindness revealed by him in suggesting a means for getting his captor's feet warm. Smilk's lawyer, at the very outset of the cross-examination, clarified the air as to the nature of the defense he was going to put up for his client. After a few preliminary questions, he demanded sharply, Now, Mr. Yollop, didn't this defendant state to you that he had been unable to get work, and that his wife and family were in such desperate straits that he was forced to commit a crime against the state, in order to preserve them from actual starvation? He did not. You are quite positive about that, are you? Yes. Did he, at the time, appear to be a robust, well-conditioned man? that is to say a man who looked strong enough to work and who had had sufficient nourishment to keep his body and soul together he certainly did a big rugged healthy desperate fellow you would say yes armed with a loaded revolver yes you would say that he was big enough and strong enough to pull a trigger wouldn't you i can't answer that question i don't know how much strength it requires to pull a trigger ahem at any rate he looked as though he was strong enough to pull a trigger I dare say he could have pulled it. And yet you would have the jury believe that this big, strong, well-nourished man permitted you. By the by, how much do you weigh, Mr. Yollop? About 145 pounds in my clothes. You are six feet tall, I should say. Lacking a quarter of an inch. Ahem. As I was saying, this strong, desperate man, armed with a revolver, allowed you to walk across the room and strike him in the face, causing him to crumple up and fall to the floor as if struck by a... Well, someone like Jack Dempsey. Isn't that so? I never was so surprised in my life. Counsel, thunderously, answer my question. Well, I hit him and he fell. Do you regard yourself as an experienced boxer? No, I don't. Are you what may be termed a powerful man, able to strike a powerful blow with the fist? I don't know. The defendant can answer that question better than I can. Counsel, to the court. Your Honor, I appeal to you to direct this witness to answer my questions. The Court. Confine your answers to the questions as they are put to you, Mr. Witness. Counsel to Yollop. Now see if you can answer this question, Mr. Yollop. You have described in direct examination that this defendant was a big, burly, rough-looking man. You say you were surprised when he went down under your inexpert blow. Why were you surprised? I was surprised to find how easy it is to knock a man down. I see. You had never knocked a man down before, is that so? I had never struck a man before. And yet you found it singularly easy to deliver a blow on the jaw of an armed man with sufficient force to knock him down? I can only answer that question by saying that he went down when I struck him. I don't know how hard or how easy it is to knock a man down. But you admit you were surprised. Yes, I was surprised. Counsel, shaking his finger and speaking with something like malevolence in his voice and manner, don't you know, Mr. Yollop, that this man was so exhausted from lack of food that he was not only unable to defend himself from your assault, but that the weakest blow, or even a gentle push with the open hand, would have sent him sprawling? I don't know anything about that. Wasn't he so weak that he could hardly walk across the room after he arose? Possibly. He was not too weak, however, to climb up two floors on a fire escape and pry open my window before I— Now, 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 please answer my question. He complained of being dizzy. He held his hand to his jaw. That's all I can say. You were pointing the revolver at him all the time you have testified. Is that true? Yes. If he had made an attempt to attack you, you would have shot him, wouldn't you? I would have shot at him, I suppose. Counsel slowly, distinctly, dramatically. In other words, you would have been strong enough to do the thing that he was unable to do, pull a trigger. I haven't said he was unable to pull a trigger. Answer my question. The state, bouncing up, We object to this question. It calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness that the court. Objection sustained. Counsel, glaring. Exception. Then, after mopping his brow and consulting his notes, now, Mr. Yollop, you say you conversed with this defendant at some length while waiting for the police to arrive. Have you any recollection of this defendant telling you that he was driven to theft because he had been out of work for nearly three months? No. Didn't he say something of the kind to you? He didn't say he had been out of work for three months. Counsel, patiently, well, what did he say? 
He said he had been out of jail for three months. Counsel, suddenly referring to his notes again, Er, ahem. By the way, Mr. Yollop, you don't hear very well, do you? I am quite deaf. He might have said a great many things that you failed to hear, especially if his voice was weak. I dare say he did. Counsel, lifting his eyebrows significantly and nodding his head. Ah! Didn't he tell you that he had a wife and several children? I don't recall that he said anything about several children. He said he had several wives. Counsel, startled. What's that? A bailiff, harshly addressing a woman in the front row of spectators. Order! Order! The woman in the front row. The dirty liar! The state, sticking its hands in its pockets and strutting to and fro, smiling loftily. Repeat the answer for the gentleman, Mr. Reporter. Never mind, never mind. I move that the answer be stricken out, Your Honor, and that you instruct the jury to disregard the supposedly facetious reply of the witness. The court to Mr. Yollop. Did this defendant say to you that he had several wives? Yollop, looking blandly at the jury until convinced by twelve expressions and the direction in which twenty-four eyes were gazing, that the court had spoken. I beg pardon, Your Honor. Were you speaking to me? The court, raising his voice. Did he tell you that he had several wives? He did. The court. Motion overruled. Proceed. Counsel. Exception. Now, Mr. Child in the front row, still gazing intently at a very bald-headed man on the opposite side of the aisle. I want my daddy! I want— The court. You must remove that child from the courtroom, madam. Officer, see that that child is removed. Remove all of them. You may remain here, madam, if you choose to do so. But the court cannot allow this trial to be— the woman in the front row. Please, Your Honor, if you will let me keep them here, I'll promise to— The court. Officer, remove those children at once. The woman. And what's more, he tells a dirty lie when he says— The court. Silence. You will have to leave the room also, madam. This is outrageous. Officer. The state, magnanimously. May it please the court, the state has not the slightest objection to the lady and her children remaining in the courtroom provided they do not interrupt these proceedings again. The court, melting a little. Do you think you can keep those children quiet, madam, and refrain from audible comments yourself? Yes, sir. I'm sure I can. The court. It is not my desire to be harsh with you, madam, but if this occurs again, I shall have you ejected from the room. Proceed. Counsel. Now, Mr. Yallop. You have testified that you bound and gagged your sister at the direction and command of this defendant, and that he rifled the apartment at will, keeping you covered with a revolver. You also have stated that you laid the pistol on the desk, within his reach, when you believed the police to be at the door. Why did you do that? Because I did not think that I needed it any longer. Counsel, sarcastically. Oh, ho! So that was the reason, eh? Well, I was glad to be rid of it. I was dreading all the time that it might go off accidentally. They frequently do. I see. Now isn't it a fact, Mr. Yollop, that you laid the revolver down to go to the assistance of this defendant, who was in a fainting condition? No, it isn't. He was all right. Don't you know that you laid it down because you were convinced in your own mind that he was physically unable to take advantage of it, that he was in no condition to use it? No. Counsel, with a pitying look at the jury. He was still the big, strong, able-bodied man that you had knocked down with your brawny fist, eh? Yollop, mildly. He may have been a little sleepy. I was. A bailiff. Order! Order! Counsel, severely. Now, Mr. Yollop, will you tell this jury why, after you had found it so simple to knock the defendant down and disarm him earlier in the evening, you failed to repeat the experiment when he had you covered the second time? The first time I acted on the spur of the moment, and under stress of great excitement. I had had time to collect my wits by the time he gained possession of the revolver. I wasn't as foolhardy as I was at the beginning. I was afraid he would shoot me if I tackled him again. Isn't it a fact that he appeared much stronger and not so weak and listless as when you first encountered him? I didn't notice any change in him. Didn't you testify a while ago that while he was sitting at your desk, under cover of the gun, he ate a whole box of chocolate creams at your generous invitation? Yes, he ate them all right. Wouldn't you, as an intelligent man, assume that a pound of chocolates might have the effect of restoring to a half-starved man a portion of his waning strength, 
at least a sufficient amount to encourage him to put up some kind of a fight against you the state we object the question calls for a conclusion on the part of the witness who does not even pretend to be an expert or an authority on the pathological counsel but he does pretend to be an intelligent man doesn't he i submit your honor that the question is proper and i the court objection sustained the witness may state that the defendant ate a box of chocolate creams he cannot give an opinion as to the effect the chocolates may or may not have had on him counsel exception mr yollop was on the stand for half an hour longer counsel for the defense was driving home to the jury the impression that smilk was a poor half-starved wretch who had gone back to thieving after a valiant but hopeless attempt to find work in order to support his wife and children he announced in arguing an objection made by the state that it was his intention to prove by the man's wife that smilk was a good husband and was willing to work his fingers off for his family but that he had been ill and unable to find steady employment mrs champney testified at the afternoon session she made a most unfavorable impression on the jury she got very angry at smilk's counsel and said such spiteful things to him and about his client that the jury began to feel sorry for both of them two detectives and three policemen in uniform testified that smilk was the picture of health and a desperate-looking character now anybody who has ever served on a jury in a criminal case knows the effect that the testimony of a police officer has on three-fourths and frequently four-fourths of the jurors for some unexplained though perhaps obvious reason the ordinary juror not only hates a policeman but refuses to believe him on oath unless he is supported by evidence of the most unassailable nature the mere fact that the five officers swore that smilk was healthy and rugged no doubt went a long way toward convincing the jury that the poor fellow was a physical wreck and absolutely unable to defend himself on the night of the alleged burglary moreover a skilled mind reader would have discovered that mr yollop had not made a good impression on the jury almost to a man they discredited him because he was fastidious in appearance because he was known to be a successful and prosperous businessman because he was trying to make them believe that he possessed the unheard of courage to tackle an armed burglar and because he was a milliner as for mrs champney she was the embodiment of all that the average citizen resents a combination of wealth refinement intelligence arrogance and widowhood especially does he resent opulent widowhood the state rested mrs smilk was the first witness called by the defense she told a harrowing tale of smilk's unparalleled efforts to obtain work of his heart-breaking disappointments of her own loyal and cheerful struggle to provide for the children and for her poor sick husband by slaving herself almost to death at all sorts of jobs furthermore she was positive that poor cassius had reformed that he was determined to lead an honest upright life all he needed was encouragement and the opportunity to show his worth true he had been in state's prison twice but in both instances it was the result of strong drink now that prohibition had come and he could no longer be subjected to the evils and temptations of that accursed thing generically known as rum he was sure to be a model citizen and husband in fact she declared a friend of the family a man very high up in city politics had promised to secure for cassius an appointment as an enforcement officer in the great war that was being waged against prohibition this seemed to make such a hit with the jury that smilk's lawyer shrewdly decided not to press her to alter the proposition the cross-examination was brief the state how many children have you mrs smilk mrs smilk seven the defendant is the father of all of them mrs smilk with dignity are you trying to insinuate that he ain't not at all answer the question please yes he is when did you say you were married to the defendant october nineteen o six i got my certificate here with me if you want to see it i would like to see it counsel for smilk benignly the defense has no objection the state after examining the document it is quite regular with the court's permission i will submit the document to the jury the court to smilk's counsel do you desire to offer this document in evidence it had not occurred to us that it was necessary but now that a point is being made of it i will ask that it be introduced as evidence the state passing the certificate to the court reporter for his identification mark you have never been divorced from the defendant have you mrs smilk of course not then nervously 
Excuse me, but do I get my marriage certificate back? It's the only hold I got on. Counsel hastily. Certainly, certainly, Mrs. Smilk. You need have no worry. It will be returned to you in due time. The state, after reading the certificate aloud, hands it to the foreman and says, The state admits the validity of this certificate. There can be no question about it. Leans against the table and patiently waits until the document has made the rounds. Now, Mrs. Smilk, are you sure that you have not been divorced from Smilk, nor he from you? Mrs. Smilk, stoutly. Course I'm sure. You heard Mr. Yollop testify that your husband said he had several wives. So far as you know, that is not the case? I don't think he ever said it to Mr. Yollop. I think Mr. Yollop lied. I see. Then you do not believe your husband could have deceived you. I withdraw that, Mr. Reporter. You do not believe that your husband is base enough to have married another woman, or women, without first having obtained a legal divorce from you. I wouldn't be up here testifying in his behalf if I thought that. You bet. He ain't that kind of a man. If I thought he was, I'd like to see him hung. I'd like to see— Never mind, Mrs. Smilk. We are not trying your husband for bigamy. I think that is all, Your Honor. Counsel for Smilk. You may be excused, Mrs. Smilk. Take the stand, Cassius. Instead of obeying, Cassius beckoned to him. Then followed a long, whispered conference between lawyer and client, at the end of which the former, visibly annoyed, declared that the defendant had decided not to testify. The court indicated that it was optional with the prisoner, and asked if the counsel desired to introduce any further testimony. Counsel for the defense announced that his client's decision had altered his plans and that he was forced to rest his case. The assistant district attorney stated that he had two witnesses to examine in rebuttal. Send for Mrs. Elsie Morton, he directed. She is waiting in the district attorney's office, Mr. Bailiff. To the amazement of everyone, Cassius Smilk started up from his chair, a wild look in his eye. He sat down instantly, however, but it was evident that he had sustained a tremendous and unexpected shock. Mr. Yollop, who had purposely selected a seat in the front row of spectators, from which he could occasionally exchange mutual glances of well-assumed repugnance with the rascal, caught Smilk's eye as it followed the retiring bailiff. The faintest shadow of a wink flickered for a second across that smileless, apparently troubled optic. Mr. Yollop, who had been leaning forward in his chair for the better part of the afternoon, with one hand cupped behind his ear, and the other manipulating the disc in a vain but determined effort to hear what was going on, suddenly relaxed into a comfortable, satisfied attitude and smiled triumphantly. He knew what was coming, and so did Smilk. Mrs. Morton was a plump, bob-haired blonde of thirty. She had moist carmine lips, a very white nose, strawberry-hued cheekbones, an alabaster chin and forehead, and pale gray eyes surrounded by blue-black rims tinged with crimson. She wore a fashionable hat. Mr. Yollop noticed that at a glance a handsome greenish cloth coat with a broad moleskin collar and cuffs of the same fur, pearl-gray stockings that were visible to the knees, and high-gray shoes that yawned rather shamelessly at the top, despite the wearer's doughtiest struggle with the laces. Her gloves also were somewhat overcrowded. She gave her name as Mrs. Elsie Broderick Morton, married, occupation, ticket-seller in a motion-picture theater. The State. What is your husband's name and occupation? Witness. Philbert Morton. So far as I know, he never had a regular occupation. When were you and Philbert Morton married? June the 14th, 1916. Are you living with your husband at present? I am not. Have you ever been divorced from him? I have not. How long is it since you and he lived together? A little over three years. Would you recognize him if you were to see him now? I certainly would. When did you see him last? Day before yesterday. Tell the jury where you saw him. Over in the tombs. Surreptitiously? No, sir, with my own eyes. I mean, you saw him without his being aware of the fact that you were looking at him for the purpose of identification. Yes, sir. I will now ask you to look about this courtroom and tell the jury whether you see the man known to you as Philbert Morton. Witness, pointing to Smilk. That's him over there. You mean the prisoner at the bar, otherwise known as Cassius Smilk? Yes, sir. That's my husband. You are sure about that? Of course I am. 
I wouldn't be likely to make any mistake about a man I lived with for nearly six months, would I? I've got my marriage certificate here with me, if you want to see it. Mrs. Smilk in the first row, venomously addressing Mr. Smilk. So that's what you were up to when you was out for six months and never came near me once, you dirty... All bailiffs in unison. Silence! Order in the court! The state, presently. Was he a good, kind, devoted husband to you, Mrs. Morton? Well, if you mean did he provide me with clothes and jewels and gewgaws and all such, yes. He was always bringing me home rings and bracelets and necklaces and things. But if you mean did he ever give me any money to buy food with and keep the flat going, no. I slaved my head off to get grub for him all the time we were living together. Did he ever mistreat you? Oh, once in a while he used to give me a rap in the eye or a kick in the slats or something like that. But on the whole, he was pretty sensible. Sensible? In what way? I mean, he was sensible enough not to punch his meal ticket too often. It is not necessary to go any farther into the direct examination of Mrs. Elsie Morton, nor into the half-hearted efforts of Smilk's disgusted lawyer to shake her in cross-examination, nor is it necessary to introduce here the testimony of Mrs. Jeanie Finchley, who succeeded her on the stand. It appears that Jeanie was married in 1914, when Smilk was out for three months. She supported him for several months in 1916, up to the time he packed up and left her on the morning of the 14th of June that year. As Herbert Finchley, he not only managed to live comfortably off the proceeds of her delicatessen, Chapter Six of Yollop by George Barr McCutcheon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Despite the fact that the jury was out just a few minutes short of seven hours, it finally came in with a verdict of guilty as charged. Twice the devoted twelve returned to the courtroom for further instructions from the judge. Once they wanted to know if it was possible to convict the prisoner for bigamy instead of burglary and the other time it was to have certain portions of Mr. Yollop's testimony read to them. Immediately upon retiring, an amicable and friendly discussion took place in the crowded, stuffy little jury room. Eight men lighted black cigars, two lighted their pipes, one joyously, almost ravenously, resorted to a package of lucky strikes, while the twelfth man announced that he did not smoke. He had been obliged to give it up because of blood pressure or something like that. The foreman, or juror number one, was an insurance agent. He was a man of fifty, and he knew how to talk. His voice was loud, firm, overriding, and unconquerable. His manner suave, tolerant, persuasive. The bailiff, after obtaining each man's telephone number and the message he wished to have sent to his home, if any, informed the jurors that he would be waiting just outside if they wanted him, and then departed, locking the door behind him. Whereupon, the foreman looked at his watch and announced that it was twenty minutes to four. This statement resulted in the first disagreement. No two watches were alike. Some little time was consumed in proving that all twelve of them were right and at the same time wrong, paradoxical as it may sound. After the question of the hour had been disposed of, the foreman suggested that an informal ballot be taken for the purpose of ascertaining the views of the gentlemen as to the guilt or the innocence of the defendant. The result of this so-called informal ballot was nine for conviction, three for acquittal. Now we know where we stand, explained the foreman. In view of the fact that nine of us are for conviction and only three for acquittal, it seems to me that it is up to the minority to give their reasons for not agreeing with the majority. I see by your ballot, Mr. Er, Mr. Sandusky, that you are in favor of acquitting, my name is I am Pushkin, interrupted juror number seven. I wrote it plain enough, didn't I? The initials confused me, explained the foreman. Well, let's hear why you think he ought to be acquitted. I know what it is to be hungry, that's why. I see the time when I first come to this country when I didn't have nothing to eat for two, three days at a time, and everybody telling me to go to hell out of here when I ask for a job or when I tell em I ain't had nothing to eat since yesterday morning, and won't they please to help a poor feller what ain't had nothing to eat since yesterday morning, and... Six or seven voices interrupted him. 
It was juror number four, salesman, who finally succeeded in getting a detached question to him. As I was saying, where do you get any evidence that he was hungry? I guess you wasn't paying much attention to the evidence, retorted Mr. Pushkin. Didn't you hear that lawyer say over and over yet how he was almost starved to death? Didn't, wait a minute, didn't you hear him say to that deaf witness that the prisoner fell down like a log when he pushed him in the face? Just push him, nothing else. Didn't you hear that? Sure I heard it. We all heard it. But what evidence is there? Evidence? My gracious, ain't that enough? Ain't one man's word as good as another's? And say, let me ask you this. Is there any evidence that he wasn't almost starved to death? Well, hum, I guess not. There ain't a single witness that says he wasn't hungry. Not one, I tell you. You can't. Didn't all them policemen swear that he was as husky as... Say, you can't believe a policeman about anything. It's their business. That's what their job is. I know all about those fellers. Why, long time ago when I first come to this country, I told a hundred policemen I was almost starved to death and say, do you think they believed me? You bet they didn't. They told me to get a move on. Get the hell out of this. Beat it. You bet I know all about them fellers. I... The foreman interrupted Mr. Pushkin. So you want to acquit the defendant because his lawyer said he was hungry? Is that it? I don't blame nobody for stealing when he is almost starved to death and got a wife and children almost starved to death, too, because he cannot get a job yet. You bet I don't. I don't. Well, of all the damned... Can you beat this for... I never heard of... The foreman rapped vigorously with an inkwell, splashing the fluid over his fingers in quite a considerable area of the tabletop. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let us talk this thing over quietly and calmly. Mr. Pushkin seems to have a wrong conception as to what constitutes evidence. Now let me have the floor for a few minutes, and I'll try to explain to him what constitutes evidence. One hour and twenty minutes later, Mr. Pushkin admitted that he did have a wrong conception as to what constitutes evidence, but still maintained that he hated like sin to convict a man who had tried so hard to get work and couldn't. The non-smoking gentleman was one of the three who comprised the minority. He was a mild little chap with weak eyes and the sniffles. By profession, he was a clockmaker. He said he believed that the defendant was unquestionably guilty of bigamy, and that the state had erred in charging him with burglary. He was perfectly willing to send the man up for bigamy because, according to the evidence, it took precedence over the crime alleged to have been committed in December 1919. In other words, he explained, Smilk had committed bigamy some years prior to the burglary of Mr. Yollop's apartment, and he believed in taking things in their regular order. Of course, he went on to say, he would be governed by the opinion of the judge if it were possible under the circumstances to obtain it. He did not think it would be legal to put the burglary charge ahead of the bigamy charge, but if the judge so ordered, he would submit, notwithstanding his conviction that it would be unconstitutional. Several gentlemen wanted to know what the Constitution had to do with it, and he, becoming somewhat exasperated, declared that the present jury system is a joke, an absolute joke. Well, it's such men as you that make it a joke, growled juror number twelve. Gentlemen, gentlemen, admonished the foreman, let us have no recriminations, please. It occurs to me that we ought to send a note to the court, asking for instructions on this point. The note was written and dispatched in care of the glowering bailiff, who, it seems, had an engagement to go to the movies that evening, and couldn't believe his ears when he ascertained that the boobs had not yet agreed upon a verdict in what he regarded as the clearest case that had ever come under his notice. In the meantime, the third juror explained his vote for acquittal. He was a large, heavy-jowled man with sandy mustache and a vacancy among his upper teeth into which a pipe stem fitted neatly. He was the superintendent of an apartment building in Lenox Avenue. I think it's a frame-up, he said, pausing to use the bicuspid vacancy for the purpose of expectoration. That's what I think it is. Now I'm in a position as superintendent of a flat building to know a lot about what goes on among the bachelor tenants. I ain't saying that the prisoner didn't go to Mr. What's-His-Name's flat without an invitation. You bet your life he wasn't expected, if my guess is correct. I'll tell you what I think, and my opinion ought to be worth a lot, let me tell you. I think there's something back of all this that wasn't brought out in the trial. 
now here's something i bet not one of you fellers has thought about what evidence is there that this chancy woman is that deaf man's sister not a blamed word of evidence except their own statement she ain't his sister any more than i am did you ever see two people that looked less like they was related to each other you bet you didn't now i got a hunch that the prisoner followed her up to that guy's apartment what for i don't know maybe for blackmail he got into what was going on and makes up his mind to rake in a nice bunch of hush money that's been done a couple of times in the apartment building i'm superintendent of a feller i had working for me as a porter cleaned up five or six hundred dollars that way he told me this robbery business sounds mighty fishy to me now i'm only telling you the way the things look to me i don't think that woman is wallop's sister any more than she is mine it's a frame-up the whole thing is look at the way this wallop says he tied her up and all that humph can't you fellers see through this whole business he tied her up so's the police would find her tied up that's what he done the chances are she's some woman customer of his that's got stuck on him trying hats and all that and maybe getting all the hats she wants for nothing and this feller smilk he gets onto the game and goes out for a little money see what i mean so loud and so furious was the discussion that followed the extraordinary deductions of juror number nine that the bailiff had to rap half a dozen times before he could make himself heard finally the foreman purple in the face called out through the haze of smoke come in the judge says for you to come into the courtroom for instructions announced the officer never mind your hats and coats no cigars gents leave them here they'll be safe come on now it's nearly time to go to supper the judge informed the jury that they could not find the man guilty of bigamy and curtly ordered them back to their room for further deliberation they took another ballot before going out to supper at a nearby restaurant guarded by six bailiffs who warned them not to discuss the case while outside the jury room the second ballot by the way was eight for conviction four for acquittal juror number five had come over to the minority he said there was something in the theory of juror number nine there was a very positive disagreement concerning the meal they were about to partake of the foreman spoke of it as dinner and was openly sneered at by eleven gentlemen who had never called it anything but supper the little clockmaker having been overruled by the judge was in a nasty temper he accused the foreman of being a republican he said no democrat ever called it dinner it wasn't democratic upon their return to the jury room after a meal on which there was complete agreement and which brought about considerable talk about the penuriousness of the county of new york they settled down to a prolonged and profound discussion of their differences it soon developed that all but two of the jurors had been favorably inclined toward the defendant up to the time the state introduced the unexpected wives they had regarded him as a poor unfortunate driven to crime by adversity and after a fashion the victim of an arrogant and soulless police system, aided and abetted by the district attorney's minions, a contemptible robber in the person of a dealer in women's hats, and a bejeweled snob who insulted their intelligence by trying to convince them that her confidence had been misplaced. But the two wives settled it. Smilk was a rascal. He ought to be hung. But, argued number nine, how the devil do we know that them women are his wives? Their evidence ain't supported, is it? didn't they have certificates demanded another hotly sure but that don't prove that he was the man does it and didn't the prisoner jump up and yell my god it's all off you've got me cold you got me dead to rights cried another oh there's no use arguing with you guys roared number nine disgustedly later on they returned to the courtroom to have certain parts of mr yollop's testimony read to them after this a ballot was taken and the only man for acquittal was the clockmaker. At twenty minutes to eleven he succumbed, not to argument or persuasion or reason, but to a chill February draft that blew in through the open window above his head. He couldn't get away from it. The others wouldn't let him. They got him up in a corner, and he couldn't break through. He told them he was getting pneumonia, that the draft would be the death of him, that he'd take back what he said about the smoke almost suffocating him, still they surrounded him and argued with him and called him things he didn't feel physically able to call them and at last he voted guilty smilk haggard with worry for he had come to think as the hours went by without a verdict that there would be a disagreement or worse than that an acquittal 
in which case he would have to face the charge of bigamy that the district attorney had more than intimated. Smilk slouched dejectedly into the courtroom a few minutes before eleven o'clock and went through the familiar process of facing the jury while the jury faced him. He straightened up eagerly when the verdict was read. He took a long, deep breath. His eyes brightened. They almost twinkled, as they searched the room in quest of Mr. Yollop. He was disappointed to find that the gentle milliner was not there to hear the good news. The judge sentenced him to twenty years' imprisonment at hard labor, and he went back to his cell in the tombs, a triumphant, vindicated champion of the laws of his state, a doughty warrior carrying the banner of justice up to the very guns of sentiment. Mr. Yollop received a friendly letter from him some two months after his return to Sing Sing. He found it early one morning on his library table, sealed but minus the stamp that the government exacts for safe and conscientious delivery. Mr. Yollop's stenographer, being more or less finicky about English as it should be written, even by thieves, is responsible for the transcript in which it is here presented. Dear friend, I hope this finds you in the best of health. I am back on the job and very glad to be so. It is very gay up here and I am getting fat also. Regular hours is doing it, and no worry, I suppose. I wish to inform you that the movies have improved considerable since I was here before, and our baseball team is much better. Also the concerts and so on. Grub also up to standard. I never eat better grub at the Ritz-Carlton, which is no lie either. Well, Mr. Yollop, before closing, I want to say you done me a mighty good turn when you thought of them two wives of mine. If it had not been for them two women, I guess it would have been all off with me. I wish you would drop in here to see me, if you are ever up this way, so I can thank you in person. Which reminds me, there is some talk among the boys that a movement is on foot to have a regular fancy dress ball up here once a month. Some kind of a benevolent society is working on it, they say. Big orchestra, eats from Delmonico's, and a crowd of girls from the smart set to dance with us, so as we won't get out of practice, I suppose. Soon as I hear when the first dance is to be, I will let you know, and maybe you will come up to be present. I will introduce you to a lot of swell dames, and maybe you can drum up a nice trade among them, on account of their all being fashionable and needing a good many hats. It must be great to be in a business like yours, where nobody cares how many times you rob them, just so you leave them enough money to buy shoes with, because if you ask me, they ain't wearing much of anything but hats and shoes these days. Well, I guess I will close, Mr. Yollop. With kind regards, from yours truly, I remain, yours truly, C. Smilk. P.S. I forgot to mention that this letter was left in your library by a pal of mine who dropped it last night while you were asleep, unless he got nabbed like a darn fool before he got a chance to do this friendly little errand for me. He dropped in to get that wad of bills I left there some time ago. If you get this letter, he got the roll.